now we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. Uh, and this is uh, Talking Tax with Tom here on a given Thursday morning. And we have Tom and, and another unidentified guest. I, I hope you'll take a moment to introduce your unidentified unidentified guest, Tom. Yeah. Uh, for, for those of you who have uh, been fans of our um, uh, weekly commentary, you know, every once in a while, one gets written by the Hawaii State Tax Watch doggy, and here he is. So, <laughs> watch what? Except he has glasses on the uh, in, in our pictures, but uh, <laughs> he, he, he forgot his glasses this morning. <laughs> yeah, but you can see that he's watching, and he's definitely a watchdog. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, our subject this morning is the same as an article that you wrote a few days ago for Civil Beat. It's a uh, it's uh, how we're going to spend the uh, CARES Act money. Uh, the largest chunk of money, uh, 560 million, went to county governments. We're going to talk about that. But we also to talk about the balance of the 1.25 uh, billion. Uh, so, you know, how, how comfortable are you with the way they did it? Well, I'm a lot less comfortable now because uh, the, the legislature did pass a plan to uh, deploy all that money. Um, but then it went to the governor's desk and we've had some line item vetoes and, uh, uh, one can, I mean, this money is a little different. Uh, it didn't just come to the check to the state in the form of a check for, Hey, here's, here's $1.25 billion. Uh, the, the idea is you have to have expenses. They have to be incurred before year end. And they have to be related to the COVID, the, the COVID pandemic. So they, the the feds will reimburse expenses, uh, and and the, and uh, if you have anything left over, uh, it goes bye bye. So, yeah. uh, uh, and, and let me go through like some of the items that uh, that we had budgeted for, and that went through the uh, the governor's veto pen. Uh, we we start off with unemployment assistance. Uh, we, we had talked, I think, last time, and, and, and the line the line item vetoes happened just after last week's uh, last show, which was two weeks ago, uh, I think the very next day. So it was just kind of, we, we missed it by one day, Jay. Uh, but you, you may remember the, um, uh, the, the feds had been giving a $600 a week uh, boost to unemployment benefits. Uh, we, we sometimes called that the plus up. Mm -hmm. Well, that ended on July 31st. And uh, the idea was for the state to give a $100 plus up. You know, and we can't, we can't print money like the feds can. Uh, so we were just trying to uh, give the uh, people who were out, out on unemployment a little bit more uh, to live on. Uh, but inexplicably, uh, the governor basically uh, took the $230 million appropriation that was supposed to go to, to do this and he reduced it to zero. Zero. Uh, so, uh, and now, now the reasons for it uh, in the governor's veto message were, well, okay, uh, right at this moment, and this was two weeks ago, uh, there were negotiations afoot in the U.S. Capitol to see if we could extend the program and under one possible situation, there would be more than $300. I need to act now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to veto the appropriation. Uh, and I'm thinking, why? Uh, because there was so already something in the appropriation that said, if the feds kick in more than 300 bucks, uh, the state plus that goes away. Um, but now instead of 600, instead of 300, they get nothing. Somebody wasn't reading. That's what it sounds like. I mean, it, it's, it, sounds, it sounds like there's, there's a very questionable logic going on. Um, or I, I don't know if you would call it, even call that logic at all. Um, but I mean, it seems to me that uh, if, if somebody else were the governor, and they got concerned about uh, the feds kicking in enough money to uh, to make our program uh, wasteful, but then 
the governor would come in and just restrict restrict the spending at that point. He could do that. You know, he's he's restricted government uh, you know government spending before. Yeah. He's he's imposed like you know, 5% or 10% uh, cuts across the board, uh, basically saying, yeah, the legislature gave you some money, but don't spend it because I won't allow you to. So what's the net effect here? I I take it a veto at this point can't be reversed. Uh, Practically speaking, no. I mean, the the legislature would basically have have to call a special session uh, and, and go in for a veto override vote. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think technically they can do that, um, but practically speaking, it's uh, it's infeasible. Well, there's another point in your article, and we should go into it later, which does seem to call for a special session. Uh, but let's get to that later. Let's let's talk about the net effect of this line item veto on the plus up. Well, the line item veto it basically says there is no plus up. Ain't happening, right? So, what do people get? Nothing. Okay. Now, how is that changed by by Trump's proclamation, which is of questionable legality? Uh, I don't think it changes at all. Uh, the state is is the one that primarily provides the unemployment benefits, and it's from funds that were collected from the employers. Uh, so, we had put all of this money into an unemployment trust fund, and then. That is what is being spent uh, to give people unemployment benefits. Now, for some employers, um, the, like the nonprofits, for example, uh, they, they're considered self-insured. Uh, so, uh, but but still, the, uh, the the state provides the benefits in the first instance, and then, and then collects reimbursement from the employers. So, um, in in any event, uh, you know the feds are not involved. Uh, so there the is no unemployment insurance. Does that mean there's no unemployment benefits for anyone going forward? No, it's it's, it's just without the plus up. So you get your you get your unemployment benefits. You know whatever the law provides. I think it's seventy percent of your salary mm-hmm. um, uh, at at the time you are unemployed. Okay, but there's there's no kicker. You know, the, honestly, let me digress for a moment. The whole system seems so unnecessarily complex and I keep thinking <coughs> excuse me I think I keep thinking of Andrew Yang where he his view of it was just give everybody a thousand dollars a month uh, and, and that's for compensation not unemployment insurance but just give everybody a thousand dollars a month and um, you know and, uh, we'll we'll find the money for it and, and it won't depend on whether you have a job at the time uh, it won't depend on, you know, crises like COVID. You just get the money. Same thing with health insurance. It, it does suggest that, um, you know, the linking health insurance to a job uh, when the economy is in the tank and there are a lot of people out of work permanently, um, it, it just seems, doesn't it? It does suggest that we ought to have these benefits without reference to a job. Um, you may or may not agree with that, but it does suggest um, that our system is is not not functioning well. Well, I, I think the way our system is designed right now, um, th- there are uh, incentives to get back to work. Um, if you are, for example, collecting unemployment now, uh, you're, you're required to, uh, you know, put your name in a database saying you're looking for work. Uh, you're, you're required to make some calls on prospective employers. And you're required to report this to the Department of Labor, I think, every week. Um, and if you and if you uh, if you're not a good boy, uh, they won't give you your next check until you until you um, get with the program. Yeah. Well, if you've ever talked to anybody who applied for unemployment compensation in Hawaii, they'll tell you horrible stories about the bureaucracy um, and how uh, it doesn't work the way it's intended. I, I totally agree that there should be some incentive to get you back to work, um, but it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And this is, I think this is what we're learning here in the time of COVID. But back to the main trail. Right. Um, what, what else, what else uh, was part of that $1.25 billion and what happened to it? Sure. Uh, <laughs> there was a, a housing relief and resiliency program, uh, rental assistance that we talked about. 
Um, this was going to be administered by HHFDC, uh, which is the Hawaii Housing Finance and Development Corporation. Uh, they weren't going to do it themselves, but uh, the plan was for them to contract with a nonprofit intermediary uh, to establish a centralized database of some kind uh, and work with nonprofit agencies uh, to distribute funds and provide other assistance to qualified households. And qualified households would be um, renters and homeowners uh, impacted by COVID-19 in some way uh, that are not earning more than 100% of very median. Uh, AMI, area median income. The idea was to give them, uh, you know, a subsidy amounting to 50% uh, of rent up to $500 a month uh, for five months from August to, to December. Um, so the uh, appropriation that was set up for this was $100 million. Uh, the governor scaled it back to 50. Um, and, and his reason? His reason was, oh, uh, the, the department said 50 million would be okay to start. To start? You mean to start? No, a query it doesn't really sound like that's enough to make a difference for a lot of people. And that um, it's, it's not going to prevent uh, people going out on the street for the lack of funds to pay rent. It, it really it sounds pretty cheap to me. Well, <laughs> I mean... Uh, $100 million in theory could go a long way. Um, just really a question of how many um, you know, recipients are we talking about? Uh, and uh, I don't have the figures in front of me, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, who, who or, or how many people do we think need uh, this type of assistance? Uh, and, and, and why is this being scaled back so much? That's a pretty serious uh, scale back. Why did it start at 100 and go to 50? And, you know, I mean, that's a pretty big difference. <clears throat> and, yeah. if, and if you assume that the uh, unemployment compensation is not working too well, uh, then people don't have anything from that fund in order to pay the rent. And uh, remember, too, that rents in Hawaii are a little too expensive. The cost of occupancy is too high here. So it's a major factor in a lot of household budgets. Right. Yeah. So this is uh, greatly concerning. Yeah. Um, the, um, the the legislature also had uh, appropriated fifteen million dollars for uh, PPE supply chain grants, and, and this is to support local companies creating a supply chain for cleaning supplies, disinfectants, and other personal protective equipment. Uh, for example, distilleries uh, that, that convert to sanitizer production, uh, for which uh, I guess there are other federal tax exemptions also available. Uh, but what the, what the state was budgeting for was uh, grants uh, up to $500,000 per recipient uh, through the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation, HTTC. Uh, 15 million was appropriated for this. Governor slashed it to 10. Uh, same reason, uh, reasoning process as uh, for the housing program. Uh, the department said, yeah, we'll need 10 million to start. Uh, and then um, the governor says, fine, you get 10 million. Sounds like he was really being, you know, cheap. But the problem is you've got to spend it all or you lose it. So why was he? Uh, I guess he, he had priorities where he was going to spend the rest and he was sure he could spend the rest on qualified expenses so he wouldn't lose it because it has to go back, if not spent, by December. Um, what happened on, on, the, on the net effect there? Um, did he spend it all? Uh, we don't know. I mean, th there's, there's plenty of time between now and the end of the year to spend that money. Okay. Um, assuming, well, one of the issues, can, assuming he can legally do it. Yeah, one of the issues you raised in your article was that some of the money that was being spent, yeah, the slush fund, forty million slush fund, appropriated to the governor's office, uh, supposed to take care of unanticipated needs. Right. He didn't. He didn't reduce that one. He 
he kept the $40 million intact, the one going to his office. That's um, right. Query is that. It didn't touch that one. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess he, he must have had some anticipation of the unanticipated expenses. Um, okay, and uh, so there's other things too. And the, I guess the question is what, what happens if he, I, I think I know the answer. What happens if he doesn't spend this? If he doesn't spend this, he, he has to what, give it back. Sometimes it's not so easy to spend money. And, and it's not so easy to spend money in a governmental setting virtually overnight. Um, how, does that, how does that work if he vetoed line items? He cannot unveto them. Um, can he take the balance and find somewhere qualified to put it so he doesn't lose it? Um, I think in theory it's possible. I'm not really sure how. I mean, you're not supposed to, uh, yeah, as, as the executive, I, I don't think you have the authority to overspend your budget because then you uh, are, are basically ignoring the legislature and what they, and what they said. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, there must be some constitutional problem with that. And, um, uh, and I think, you know, the more appropriate, unappropriated monies you have, the harder it is going to, to it is going to be to spend uh, what you need to legally by the end of the year, because that's yeah. what's going to, that's what's got to happen. You got to spend it legally by the end of the year, and according to the the Treasury's most most recent guidance, you know, June thirtieth guidance, they they uh, they said it's not enough to you know for the money to be set aside uh, and waiting in some kind of fund. You you have to have uh, a service contracted for and delivered by the end of the year, performed by the end of the year or you need to have a product uh, that is delivered by the end of the year. Okay, you know, if, if, you, if you do that, then and you pay them a little bit late, that's okay. Um, but you have to have the performance of the vendor taking place by the end of the year. <clears throat> well, you know, it sounds a little bit uh, questionable then about the, the airport. So the bill, uh, the appropriations bill gave $90 million to the airport and true- Yeah, they go down to 70 million. He took it down to seventy million, and I, I'm not sure. I'd like your your thoughts about uh, this. Was supposed to augment airport uh, screening and health assurance security initiatives. Sounds like gobbledygook to me. Um, well, what 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 they wanted to do was buy a thermal screening system, which they've done. Um, they want uh, they wanted a web based traveler verification application, which to me is, sounds questionable, uh, and they wanted to renovate some rooms to have. You know, in some interrogation rooms, they didn't say, put, it, put it in those terms. Uh, they wanted a swab and testing facility, uh, so you can basically deal with travelers and uh, and if they and if they're you know if they're positive if they're sick, you send them back. Um, that, that that's what they wanted to do. Uh, the question then becomes: Okay, if what you want to do is do some renovations at the airport, you got to go through this permitting stuff. Um, unless, unless they think they can bypass that, uh, I mean, usually you have to, you have to, um, get plans drawn up. You need to, uh, have permits, uh, obtained and then, then you can start construction. Uh, can they do all this by the end of the year? I don't know. No, it sounds like it's, um, theoretical. It's not even divided up between one thing and another, you know, how much for the rooms, how much for the software, um, how much for the machines. <clears throat> we don't know. Somebody has to decide that. So it, all it really is is an allocation to the uh, airports division. Um, right. I, is, I think it's a big question about that. The other thing, um, maybe you know more about this than I do, but, uh, you know, somebody told me recently they flew in from the mainland and um, aside from this theoretical thing about quarantining, the airport really had no system to stop them. Uh, they walked off the plane and um, took a cab. And uh, there, was, there was really um, nothing to block them, no interrogation rooms. And uh, apparently the law does not really allow for that. So are they anticipating 
that there will be a change in the law. They haven't made a change in the law. Maybe they're anticipating, maybe the governor is anticipating that he's going to change the system at the airport. But the fact is you can walk off a plane right now and then you're on your honor. Well, uh, not, not, not entirely. I mean, the, the way that the thermal screening system is supposed to work is um, it, it, it uh, I'm, I'm talking it about the interrogation rooms, Tom. Thermal is easy. You know, I priced out those, those thermometers. Um, they cost uh, 60 bucks a piece on Amazon. Uh, you, you could, you know, you could outfit the whole airport for what, you know, a thousand dollars, the whole airport. <laughs> Well, <laughs> they, they want they want to be more sophisticated than that, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, but but I think the idea is, you know, there's some kind of t uh, uh, TV camera or sensor that takes a, a picture of a you know, entire corridor of arriving people, and uh, you know whoever's face gets lit, lit up, then you know somebody kind of jumps into the crowd and then pulls them out and says, "Okay, we need to screen you a little bit further." And everybody else just kind of can pass through. Why does that not persuade me? I mean, haven't we been reading, uh, you know, for the past, I don't know, a couple of months that the people, there are many, many people who are asymptomatic, but who shed virus all over the place. And those, uh, you know, taking temperature, thermal screening doesn't cover them. They could be walking off that plane and shedding virus in every direction and infecting everybody. And, and we would not know it from their temperature. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's just uh, one way to catch them. Um, well, what other plans they have, I don't know. I mean, they haven't yeah. really talked about that. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the, the money that went to the state. What was in your article, 560 million? I, <laughs> I'm a little confused by that because didn't Trump say that he didn't want to support the, uh, the counties? Um, and, and here, or, or rather any subdivision within the state. And here we're doing that. Is, that, is this okay? Or is this objectionable in some way? Uh, according to the guidance I looked at under the, under the CARES Act, it's perfectly fine. Um, the guidance was put up by Treasury. Uh, so unless, um, uh, unless Trump shakes down Manukin and, and, uh, and, and says something very different, you know, we're still getting that money, or at least we're eligible to, mm -hmm. uh, unless um, uh, unless we don't spend it. Well, yeah. So, so they give it. You give uh, what was it? I've had three hundred and eighty-seven million to um, to say Oahu. Honolulu, yeah. And, yeah, and uh, so so all right. Um, it's not getting spent. It's simply going to one county. Is that spending it? Um, or is that is that subject to refund? I'm not entirely sure how that works. Um, but I, I think the I think the refund the uh, rules for counties are a little maybe a little different from states, but I'm not entirely sure. Okay, well I don't you know uh, we had a survey recently and a lot of people re responded to the survey. It's not over yet, but um, to say that they really did not have a high level of confidence in state government about the way the state government has handled COVID. That's, that's, that's my opinion, that's, that's uh, the people who responded to our think tech survey. And I'm, I'm troubled that this is, this is part of it. The other part of it, of course, um, is the, uh, the failure of testing and tracing here. Um, and I noticed there was nothing directly attributable to testing and tracing. Am I right about this? As the yeah. 1.25, it did not, did, did anything go to testing and tracing? No, I think that's that's from another part of the CARES Act. Um, so, so I think there's, there was a separate pot of money that went to the Department of Health. Hmm. Uh, anyway, it goes to the question of whether you're confident about how the state is doing. I mean, uh, there are people who are calling for the resignation of uh, public health officials because they have failed to develop a, a testing program and a tracing program. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's really tough because... Uh, you know, even even the senators who were uh, tasked with, uh, you know, overseeing some COVID response, uh, they they went to a uh, to the Department of Health on a surprise visit, uh, and they found, and they talked to the people who are actually doing this, and and they found, oh, we only have ten people or fifteen people. What? Are you kidding me? 
and each each one has like you know hundreds of cases. Well, they were supposed to have uh, they were supposed to have something over four hundred, and uh, I mean, surely there's a lot of people out of work who'd like to have those jobs. Not rocket science. You just follow a list of instructions and a list a a, a, a scenario a, a script on the computer, and you talk to people on the phone with the script. That's tracing, and you enter information in fields on a program. It's it's not complicated. They could find people, but they didn't find anybody. But they they said they have like four hundred people trained, um, and they have hundred people deployed. But where are they? Uh, the, the the senators found fifteen, um, and maybe a few on the neighbor islands, maybe another five. Um, so what? We got twenty people. You know, where's the other E that we're supposed to have? It's quite remarkable because our, our, uh, we're, we're known nationally as a, a big hotspot. Uh, we've done bad. I, I think I heard somebody say we've done worse than any other state in terms of the you know, uh, geometric progression of our caseload. Um, and um, we're having 200 cases plus per day in a population as small as Hawaii. That's quite remarkable. Um, you'd think that the health department would be working 24 by 7 to trace everything, but apparently we're not doing that. Apparently not doing that. Yeah. So this, you know, I guess, uh, I guess this, this leads to the question of, uh, it's a qualitative question, but uh, have, have we done, have the state, has the state done a good job with this 1.25 billion or are we thrashing around with it? You know, to, to me, there is a very serious question about whether we're going to be able to spend that money by year end. Um, people who think that it'll be easy piece of cake, you know, I think they're fooling themselves. Um, we need to have plans in place now. We, we need to have, you know, we need to, we need to be in the execution stage right now. We need to uh, be helping these people, not, not, not sitting around trying to figure out, you know, uh, oh, you know, we, uh, the feds might do something later, so let's wait until later. It ain't going to happen. We don't have time for this. Yeah. Well, will, will Trump's proclamation help to any significant degree? I mean, putting aside the fact that a lot of people, a lot of people think that it's illegal anyway. Yeah, I, I don't think, I don't see, you know, Trump's uh, executive orders and memos and so forth. Um, are, are really going to help a whole lot. Uh, and, uh, you know, it definitely won't do the same uh, degree of good as a deal in Congress. Um, what we need is a deal to happen, and we need it to happen now. Yeah. Well, I, was, I, I hadn't seen it, but um, yesterday the Star Advertiser had a, a program involving Josh Green which is actually available today on the Star Advertiser, and I, I will look at it later. People said that he was uh, very articulate and his points were well taken. And so what, you know, what we get is um, maybe a, um, a diversion between what the governor is saying, Bruce Anderson, Sarah Park on that side, and Josh Green on this side. Uh, which, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word divisiveness, but I think that pretty much what it is. They don't agree. They're not doing the same thing. They're not saying the same things. Um, and this, of course, leads to a lack of public confidence. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree with that. And, and, uh, and then uh, our congressional delegation has been getting in the mix, too. Um, you know, uh, Schatz has uh, come out and said, uh, said uh, uncomplimentary things. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard has, has, has basically called for the resignation of the top uh, people in Department of Health. Um, it, it, it looks like we're in so much disarray right now. I, I can I can't blame the public for uh, for having no confidence. No, and uh, and you know a serious issue is uh, um, that for the what the rest of August is it maybe till September sometime Congress is not going to do anything. They're they're out of they're out of session on vacation, I'm not sure what it is. And it's mostly the Senate as usual, but they're not gonna be able to do legislation. They couldn't before. They frittered around for you know a month or more, uh, never came to any agreement. Uh, the Democrats uh, in the House uh, had a program 
set up with three trillion more dollars uh, in May, but that never had never got any traction in the Senate, and that left the vacuum for Trump, and he filled it badly. The result is that we're not going to see any more real money uh, from the federal government for at least a month. At least a month. How do you feel about that? Well, I mean, it's it's like anything else. You know, you can't really depend on government. Uh, you really have to look out for yourself um, and your family. And I, and I hope all of us can do that. Okay. Well, let's, uh, nevertheless, let's meet in a couple of weeks' time and take stock about what has happened here and what could happen and is and will happen. Um, I don't, you know, at this point, um, the, as Jean Paul Sartre used to say, les jeux sont faits. Um, it's been spent or not. Uh, I don't think there's a whole lot of discretion left between now and December. We'll see. And maybe we'll know more in the next time we meet. Thank you, Tom. Tom Yamachika, Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on the show. Aloha.